welcome back to another episode of Ask, Seek and Knock. Uh, for the next one hour, uh, we will have two presenters. Uh, one is my husband here, Dr. Thomas Carr. He's a theologian, philosopher, right? Right. Yes. I'll and, go by that. <laughs> and the second one will be uh, Father Ignatius Schweitzer, uh, a Dominican priest. And my name is Ina Carr. I'll be the host of uh, the show. And in this show, you can call the number on the screen if you have any questions about um, church uh, teaching, about theology, uh, anything about spiritual life, you're welcome to call in. We will, not we, but they will, you know, try to answer, right? Right. So uh, let's open up with prayer first. Okay. Yeah. Sure. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father God, we ask your blessing upon this time together and we ask that your Holy Spirit would inspire our minds with just the right words that you would like to see us speak out and just the right words that people who are watching this need to hear. May your Holy Spirit speak words of wisdom, encouragement and healing to all those who are tuning in to us today. We offer this time up to your Holy Mother and to the um, to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is His in His name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, uh, Dr. Thomas Carr has been a professor, well, was a professor for 17 <coughs> years, uh, philosophy and theology. So again, mm -hmm. if you have any question, and we have question that you want to follow up from last week about the. Uh, what is the best argument to prove God's existence? You want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify a little bit and uh, fill out my answer a little bit better. I felt like I didn't quite say what I wanted to say last week, so I'm happy for the second chance. So uh, I really want to suggest that there are two very good arguments that you can use to um, speak to the heart of an atheist with. Um, one of the things about being an atheist is that, and this would be the first argument, um, you're locked in to believing some very absurd ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for those ideas, there's very little in the way of support. In fact, there really is, is no evidence <clears throat> at all to support these ideas. So atheism on, on the face of it is a, an absurd stance. And let me give you some examples. One of the things that you have to believe if you're an atheist is that the universe as we know it, the, the world around us, came to be from nothing. We know from the science of the Big Bang that there was a start to the universe and that prior to that start, there was nothing. There wasn't even space because space is the measurement of the distance between objects and there were no objects. There was no time before the Big Bang, because time is the measurement of the movement of objects, and again, there were no objects. Hmm. It was just a pure vacuum of space, or not even space, I'm sorry. There was just pure nothingness. <laughs> and the atheist believes that this amazing universe that we see with all of its materiality, its diversity and its order and so on, all came from nothing. There was a Greek philosopher named Parmenides who said this long time before Jesus lived that nothing can come from nothing. <laughs> it's a basic principle of logic and reason. So if you're an atheist, you have to believe that something can come from nothing, and of course that's absurd. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence for that at all. Another thing you have to believe is that this isn't the only universe that exists. There are millions, billions, even perhaps an infinite number of universes that are out there. We just happen to live in the one that has the constants of nature that are uh, amenable to life. There are 27 constants of nature. They're all very precisely calibrated, and if they're just a little bit stronger, a little bit weaker than where they're at, we would not have life, mm. couldn't have life. The gravitational constant, for example, if it was a little bit smaller, or stronger, rather, everything would collapse in on itself. If it was a little bit weaker, the everything tilt would, of the, earth, right? the tilt of the Earth, the distance of the Earth to, mm -hmm. the, to the moon, and, and on and on. So if this universe came about by a random chance event and has everything that's precisely calibrated to uh, per allow life to happen, then the only conclusion that you can draw is that there must be an infinite number of universes out there that ha also have constants 
but they're not like ours. They're not precisely calibrated in the way ours is. We just happen to live in the one where everything is perfect. Of course, there is no evidence for any other universe than the one we're in. So again, an absurd belief based on no evidence at all. Uh, this is one of my favorites, and there are several others I could go into, but in this, for the sake of time, I'll save those for another show. Um, you have to believe, if you're an atheist, that organic matter, which is the part of matter that is the building block or provides the building blocks for uh, uh, organic molecules, which are the backbone of life itself, organic matter came from inorganic matter. So every planet that gets its start starts with nothing but inorganic matter. Table salt is an example of inorganic matter. Uh, carbohydrates, fats, lipids, proteins, these are examples of organic matter. Mm. Organic matter can only come from the building blocks of living organisms. They don't come from anything organ inorganic. So if the planet started with nothing but inorganic matter, with no organic compounds whatsoever, how did we get the building blocks for life? Organic matter only comes from life, so which came first, right? Life or organic matter? It's a chicken and egg kind of thing. And so you're locked in again to believing that somehow, some way, organic matter cobbled itself together from inorganic matter, and there's no evidence to suggest that's even possible. So again, uh, you're, you're left with an absurd belief if you're an atheist, and logically speaking, those ideas can't be held uh, together very coherently. Uh, just one last one, because I think this is probably the best argument among these arguments that we might label as uh, the absurdities of atheism. The best one of, of these is a very simple one. An atheist believes that the brain that does all of our thinking is a product of chance mutations over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. right? Everything that has evolved, according to an atheist, has evolved through the chance and random genetic mutations that bring about change over time, and that the human brain is a product of that chance sequence of events. So if the human brain is a product of random chance, on what grounds are we to trust it? Right? How can we trust our thinking process if it's the product of something that is just by chance, by random chance? The only brain that I would trust is one that I know is designed by a very intelligent being to actually think in a logical and coherent way. That's the brain we have. Mm -hmm. Our brains do think that way. But that implies that an intelligence is behind it. So again, if you're an atheist, God bless you, we love you, we pray for you. <laughs> but man, you are locked in to believing some really, really silly things. Uh, let, me add, let me add one more, because I just it's okay. found out about this. Okay. <laughs> so a, a second type of argument that you can use with an atheist is, you know, dear friend atheist, what do you do with miracles? Mm -hmm. What do you do with yeah. the fact that there are these these amazing events that supersede natural law for which there is no natural explanation and they still occur, they happen. So what do we do with those? Call in. We guess we have a call coming in here. Hello. Yes, uh, I wanted to leave a question for Dr. Carr. Okay, hi. Sure. Hi, Patricia. Hi. Hi, Patricia. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi, yes, what's your question? Okay, um, I had uh, the TV on. It was, uh, I believe, EWTN. I'm not sure. But uh, I didn't have a chance to really listen to it. But there was a gentleman speaking about faith. No, it, well, it was a channel. Yeah, that was mm -hmm. correct. That was and he was talking about if you have real, true faith, that you can, you'll be able to do, uh, you'll be capable of supernatural things. Um, just by having that faith and really, really believing in God. Mm -hmm. And um, I had never heard anything like that. And I was wondering if Dr. Carr knew anything further about it. 
Okay, okay. Let me have him answer. Thank you for your call. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you, Patricia. That's a very Thank good you. question. Very good question. Uh -huh. Thank so, you. <laughs> yes. No, it, and it's a very interesting question. Um, I think it's important for us to make a distinction, a very clear distinction, between uh, faith, which is an infused virtue, and theologians call it a theological virtue. It is something that God puts into us. Keep going. Okay. And uh, it's not something that we have naturally. We, we, by nature, we don't have the ability to believe in God, but God gives us the grace to believe. And that's faith. That's an infused virtue. And we have to understand that faith is the belief in God, the belief in the gospel, the belief that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, the belief yes. that God is a merciful God. And so faith is really about what we believe, what we hold to be true, what we give our assent to. And the supernatural events that you're talking about, and we can think of so many from the lives of the saints, right? They're amazing, uh -huh. amazing things that the saints were able to do. They levitated, they performed miracles of mm -hmm. healing, they spoke words of prophecy. Um, Padre Pio, you know, famously in the confessional could tell you what your sins were, even if you weren't aware of them yourself. So there's this amazing things, supernatural things that the saints were able to do. Um, I would suggest that they do those things not so much because of their faith, but more because of their love. So it's love that enables us to uh, unite ourselves to God and in uniting uh -huh. ourselves to God, we, uh, our spiritual self grows closer and closer to uh, becoming like God. We will never become God. We need to be clear about that. But we yes. can become more and more like him. We come, become more and more like his children, his sons and daughters. And that happens uh -huh. through love. I mean, faith is kind of the door that we open to get into that path, but we progress to the end of our union with God, and that's, of course, eternal, eternal life, right? Eternal life is spending forever and ever in the presence of God in a loving bond of union. Um, love is what helps us progress along that path. Yeah. Faith opens the door. Love helps us progress. And so I would take issue with this fellow on television. Uh, mm -hmm. You can have all the faith in the world and believe all the right things and never see a single supernatural event mm -hmm. in your life. And there's nothing wrong with your faith. There's nothing okay. wrong with your faith. Yeah. Many, many saints who uh, suffered horribly in this life. And you would think if they only had enough faith, they could have healed themselves with their prayer or they could have avoided persecution or they could have turned themselves invisible. Like, uh, who is it? The Dominican saint used to turn himself invisible to escape the... Oh, St. Martin de Porres. St. <laughs> Martin de Porres. Um, but uh -huh. that, that didn't happen for them. And that says nothing about their faith. They had beautiful faith, heroic faith. So... Uh, okay. Yeah, faith, faith and the supernatural acts of, of sanctity are not necessarily uh, uh, lock in step like that. Yeah, I think I uh, remember, you know, we were, con we were convert from Protestant and faith was a big issue, you know, not yeah. issue, but it's a big hope. It's almost like if you have faith in your faith, then something will happen. Miracles will happen or you will get healed. And then yeah we kind of get into corner into a place well if you don't get healed that means we don't have enough faith right mm -hmm. and and then uh -huh. that, that's a wrong perspective you know right. it's god that heals not our faith really right yeah he can do whatever okay. he wants yeah i yeah. just wanted to say that this gentleman that was uh, on tv uh, i really didn't listen to his whole uh, what he was talk, speaking about on faith, I didn't have a chance, but I just heard a few sentences that he said, so I really don't know what he was actually saying about it. Sure. I just heard a few sentences, sure. and I just wanted to know about that. Okay. okay. That was a great question. Thank yeah, you for good calling question. in. Thank you, Patricia. Okay. Thank you. Bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Oh, so back to our greatest arguments for an atheist. Miracles. The miracles, right. And this is something very new. Just a few months ago, there was an article published in Smithsonian Magazine about an archaeological discovery in the Middle East 
that is believed to be the ancient city of Sodom. Oh, yeah. And Sodom was buried under all kinds of sand and the de you know, detritus of different civilizations on top of it. But they got all the way down to the level that they believe was the time period for the existence of the biblical city of Sodom that, of course, was destroyed mm -hmm. by fire and brimstone for their sinful behavior. Uh, the archaeologists discovered that the city that they found in the sand, which is in the general geographic location where it should be if it is Sodom, was burned by a powerful force 1,000 times stronger than the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Wow. A thousand times stronger. And it's estimated that this explosion took place two and a half miles above the city. So it would have been somewhere up in the atmosphere. And it exploded over the city, fire raining down upon the city, burning everything to a crisp. I mean, you find sand that has been turned into glass. You find pottery that's melted. You find um, fragments of bone that are uh, pulverized by this blast. A thousand times more powerful than Hiroshima. And then after that, there was some sort of a what they call a mega wind that blew everything down to the ground, buried it underneath a lot of sand, and it was a wind that was 750 miles per hour in strength. There's no natural event. There's no natural event that could have caused either of those things. Mm -hmm. An explosion two and a half miles up in the air, you know, no, no lightning, no th thunder, thunder cell is going to do anything like that. And there's not a wind on the planet, even the strongest hurricane or tornado, that can get up to 750 miles an hour. So, miracles, right? What are you going to do with that if you're an atheist? This is underlining the, the historical reliability of Scripture. And if, if Scripture is historically reliable and it narrates a lot of miracles like that, maybe those miracles actually happened. There was an interesting uh, discussion between... C.S. Lewis and a good friend of his, they were both atheists at the time. They were both students of classical literature and they knew mythology really well. They knew what it sounded like. They knew what kind of forms are uh, used in the uh, expression and so on. And they challenged each other to read the New Testament, thinking that it was mm. myth. Right? They thought it was just another kind of religious mythology. So the one read the New Testament to the other, and after a few hours of this reading, Lewis's friend turned to C.S. Lewis and said, rum thing seems to have really happened once. <laughs> and that shook Lewis to the core, because this friend of his who was an atheist, he thought was safe. But it turns out that he was so convinced that the New Testament was not myth, but was actually narrating history that it really shook Lewis, shook Lewis to the core and triggered a series of events that led him to become one of the greatest uh, Christian apologists. Hmm. So miracles, 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 miracles. Now, as Christians and as Catholics, we have access to the greatest historical artifact mm -hmm. that ever existed <laughs> that demonstrates that the greatest miracle of the scripture actually happened. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Please tell us. <laughs> I'm talking about the Shroud of Turin, uh, yes. one of my favorite topics. Yeah. So we have the burial shroud of Jesus. Imprinted in this shroud are not only the blood stains of someone who suffered horrendous torture and crucifixion, but also the outline of his facial features, his hair, his bones, his flesh, his musculature. It was imprinted in this fabric. And by the way, the fabric itself should only have lasted 30, 40 years at the most. It was a natural fiber, can't survive being in the open air for so long, and it has survived 2,000 years. That in itself is rather miraculous. But the, um, this imprint, there is no natural explanation for it. It was not painted on there. It, it was believed for a long time to be a medieval forgery, but there was no technology in the medieval times to turn it into that kind of an image. It's actually a photographic negative. 
So if you look at it at face value, you see what should be dark is light, what should be light is dark. When you take a negative of it, it actually comes up in full, vibrant um, clarity. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of interesting, um, miraculous uh, occurrences that come with the Shroud of Turin, and we were absolutely convinced, many are absolutely convinced, even some of the atheists who are working on it are convinced that this was the burial shroud of Jesus. And mm -hmm. if it was the burial shroud of Jesus, that doesn't in itself prove that he rose from the dead, but the image, how mm -hmm. did it get there? It's estimated that the energy that it took to imprint that image in, on the internal parts of the fibers must have been well, more energy than the sun, much more powerful than the sun. Again, an energy like that doesn't exist on Earth. It must, and there's nothing in nature that could create that, so it must be, uh, it must be a miracle. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Is it's, that strong? It is. Wow. Absolutely. And that's the same resurrection power that we have in us. Yeah, that's what Saint I'm saying. St. Paul said yes. that, yeah. I remember when I converted to Protestant when yeah. I was 25 years old. I'm, I'm very logical in my thinking, and I had to see the power of God physically, which is, yeah. you know, it's in my testimony. But also I did a lot of historical study. Is this actually real? And I, I, I found out that archaeologists use the Bible to dig, to find yes. artifacts. So yes. to me, I was blown away. In <laughs> fact, the guy that, in, that found Sodom, he was a pastor, and he had some background in archaeology, and he was mm. just there in the Holy Land on a, on a pilgrimage, and he took out the Old Testament, and he started reading, he said, wait a minute, Sodom, according to his study, was supposed to be in one spot, but as he's reading scripture, he says, no, wait, the scripture is mm. telling me it's in a, di a different spot. Yeah. So he hired some diggers or people that do that sort of thing and went off to the spot where it thought it was and sure enough, they found it. Wow, Yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. So these are slam dunk arguments. I mean, there's just, there's just no way you can be an atheist and be rationally coherent in your belief. It's just not possible. These are, these are open and shut cases for the existence of God. Mm -hmm. And there's so much more to that we can say on that too, so, several more. Yeah. yeah, I think that's all the time we have. We can sure. talk about it more next next week. But I think one of my opinion about atheists, I know, I know when I didn't believe in God, has nothing to do with what you said. I just didn't believe in Him right. because I was upset or angry. It's more a heart issue for me yeah. instead of my yeah. intellect. Yeah, and that's the way it is for most people. I think. Yeah, I don't there think are some that really kind of thought it through and they're trying yeah. to work out their coherent argument, but yeah. it's not possible. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's all we have time for now, and uh, we will have Father Ignatius in the second uh, session. Very good. Thank you.
welcome back to our second episode, um, As Seek and Knock. We have now Father Ignatius with us. He is a Dominican priest from the Eastern Province, and he is the prior of the St. Catherine Siena Priory in New York City. Welcome, Father. Thank you. Good to be back. Yeah. Currently, I'm at Providence College. We're continuing our provincial chapter. Awesome. How is it going? Oh, great. It's been, yes. it's been going really well. Excited about some of the legislation and discussions and conversations. So good things are happening. That's exciting, exciting. Well, we're going to talk about, I guess, uh, well, today actually officially is the Corpus Christi feast day, isn't it? Correct. Right. So, but the procession, everything is happening on Sunday for most yeah. churches. Yeah, it's a solemnity that's, that's moved to, to Sunday to help uh, give all people a, a chance to attend. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so most people will have their processions uh, this coming Sunday, but it's worth thinking about yet today already. Okay. It's, it's one of my favorite feast day. Um, and, of course, we're Dominican. It has something to do with St. Thomas Aquinas, right? Yeah, he wrote those beautiful hymns. Yes, yes. So I guess we're going to talk about Eucharist and um, what has been the, the significance of Eucharist in your life. Father, huh. I guess yeah, you're a no, priest, good... but, you know. <laughs> right. No, certainly the Eucharist had a, a huge influence on, on my life and me becoming a priest. And I grew up Catholic, but I didn't appreciate really what the Eucharist is, the treasure we have in the Eucharist. Um, I don't know if you would have quizzed me if I would have. I probably wouldn't have gotten the right answer if I would have said it was a symbol. Um, but then it, it's really in college. I had a turnaround and turned to the faith, and then, then eventually to Catholicism. And that transition, that conversion from evangelical Protestantism to Catholicism, um, the Eucharist was at the center of it. Mm. And so one of the things, the first things I did in that search was to read the seven letters of St. Ignatius, Ignatius of Antioch. And um, he's clear on the Eucharist being that the true flesh and blood of Christ and the heretics deny that. And but the, the big breakthrough there, you know, reading some other books, kind of intellectually becoming convinced uh, of the Catholic Church's teaching on the Eucharist and transubstantiation, that the Eucharist is Christ's true body, blood, soul, and divinity. First, I became convinced of that on an intellectual level. Then I had a friend who invited me to join him for uh, Eucharistic Adoration, Exposition of the Blessed Sacrament, at this chapel that was, wasn't too far from our college campus, open, open 24 seven. And so he brought me there. And um, we enter that little chapel. My friend, he enters his face at the ground in worship of our Lord in the Eucharist. And, you know, I have like John chapter six before me. Um, and I'm, I'm convinced that our Lord Jesus is present in the Eucharist. And so what I had come to on an intellectual level, I began to, to believe and be convinced of, even almost experientially convinced that, that he's there, he's present. Um, so then that started um, a, a period of just spending a lot of time in Eucharistic adoration. This was even before I was fully reconciled to the Catholic Church. Yeah. I would even I would go to daily to mass, but I wouldn't receive yet because I was still kind of in this um, searching period. Um, but I started to spend a lot of time praying before our Lord Jesus uh, and the Blessed Sacraments, and just began to to see that the Lord Jesus was enough for me. Spending time with Him in the Eucharist was what it's all about, and to helping other people appreciate what we have in the Eucharist and grow in love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. And so early on, after spending, you know, night after night, hours upon hours um, in the presence of our Lord in the Eucharist, I did uh, begin to sense a call to the priesthood. And first seeing how Eucharistic adoration was enough for me, and that there's nothing more important I could do than help and to celebrate the Mass and help others to grow in love of our Eucharistic Lord. And so, source and summit of the Christian life, we say, and that's certainly been, been proven true in my own life. The source 
uh, gracious source of a desire to grow in holiness, a source of our Lord Jesus Christ coming to us, but then also the summit. We would never surpass the Eucharist. It's, it's a place where the deepest intimacy with the Lord is available as well. And so, yeah, certainly um, my life as a Catholic, the Eucharist has been front and center at the heart of things. Wow. Which makes sense, right? Because it's the Lord Jesus himself. And it's a way, in, in sort of a way, that his incarnation is extended through all space and time. Someone shared with me that this past weekend, he's kind of on, he's a Protestant now, but he's on his journey to the Catholic faith. And then he noted that First John, you know, it says, well, who, who, what's the spirit of the Antichrist? It's the spirit that denies that Jesus has come in the flesh. And he just pointed out how in, in the Eucharist, like that's one way that mm -hmm. uh, rejecting the, the Eucharist is one way that that Antichrist spirit uh, is, is alive in our, our own day. And so at the heart of, of the faith is accepting the word made flesh, the son of God come in the flesh. And that becomes all the more poignant and decisive and in the Eucharist, where we are face to face with our Lord Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity, the Lord himself and our midst in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Father. Yeah. <laughs> well, since you asked me that, well, let me turn the tables on you. You know, what's, What's the significance <laughs> of the Eucharist in, in your life? Do you, you have Do you covers. have all day? Do you have all year? <laughs> it's going to be a long one. Oh my goodness, I I can't even begin because um, I guess I converted five years ago from Protestant, and it was not really through the Eucharist. It was more through a teaching that the Lord has been taking me on a journey about union, about suffering, about intimacy. And so from the Gospel of John and, of course, when I read St. John of the Cross, that he converted me, basically. But the Eucharist realization came, I guess, a few months, probably, after the conversion. So I was taking it, thinking, oh, yeah, it's the body of Christ. I believe it's the body of Christ. But it didn't hit me until a few months. And I remember with my husband, because we converted together, we would go to church, we would take the Eucharist, and he would just sit in the parking lot, and it's like, this is like peace bomb, I can't move. <laughs> That's how powerful it is. But, and, and, and now five years, it's becoming increasingly more amazing, because I can see the result of taking the Eucharist in my body, what it does to me in my soul, in my spirit. As a being, I completely change. And, and I guess the only way I can explain is I was explaining this to someone else. Um, before I was a Catholic, I didn't realize I was very anemic, very, very anemic. And realizing it's almost like I tumble upon this, like, you know, those Chinese buffet <laughs> where you go in and you can eat anything that you want. And I stumble upon the Catholic Church, which I didn't know even Jesus was present, that Eucharist was there. And now I can eat whatever I want. So I, I don't even have words. I, say, I, I always say to people my conversion story that when I enter into the Catholic Church, my jaw just drop. And even until now, I still can't pick it up. I'm still, it's still dropping. I'm still eating. I'm still kind of like almost drowning of all this goodness that, that I receive in the Catholic Church. I mean, for one, of course, Jesus himself is there, you know? As a Protestant, we always pray for the presence of God to come. The presence of God is in front of you. You can yeah. see him, you can touch him, you can consume him. I, I still can't wrap my head around that. So I, I can go on and on and on, but it's, it's, it's my life is everything. It, it's, I still can't believe that I'm Catholic. So. That's the Eucharist, just one. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. It's so true. The deeper you go, yeah. the greater depths that open yet before you. So yes. it is this, this never-ending journey. Uh, the deeper you go, uh, the, the new or the new depths open up before your, your eyes and your heart to, to go deeper. And so yeah, the riches of the Catholic faith are like that. Yes. And the riches of the Eucharist, especially, it just it just more people can get just their foot in the door to, to taste this, to see this to experience this, uh, to know this, exactly. to be convicted of this, uh, then all, you know, more and more just opens up. Yeah, it's, I think the Eucharist have that effect on, on just like God, you know, you taste a little bit and you get, you get, you, you get more hungry every time, you know, you go to the adoration, you know, like kind of like going to the gym, you go 10 minutes, half an hour, and then you can't live without it. You know, that, yeah. that's what Jesus does, you know, he attracts us slowly, but then he comes into you and you just can't live without him. 
Eucharistic hunger. Yes, yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it changes you. It changes me. I mean, my daughters say, you're nicer as a Catholic, so there's the <laughs> proof right there, my teenage daughter. <laughs> Okay, so another question I have is that um, there is a, what do you think about, you know, what will come about from the Eucharistic revival pro promoted by the bishops? I guess it's coming. It's coming or is it already here? I forget exactly the day that begins, but yeah, it's coming, coming soon. Um, but yeah, just, I think it's a, a refocus on the Eucharist. A refocus on the Eucharist and seeing that is going to be the source of a revival. Where I think about all the fallen away Catholics, Catholics who no longer attend Sunday Mass, yeah. and what's going to draw them back? Um, well, if they have come to appreciate what, what we have, have in the Eucharist, you know, because it's kind of my own story in miniature, or my own story is kind of an ex a microcosm of, I think, the bigger situation. You know, I was Catholic for years growing up but didn't realize the treasure that we have in the Eucharist, didn't really recognize that it's our Lord Jesus Christ truly present. Mm -hmm. And once someone comes to recognize that and be convicted of that, receive that grace, then the whole one's whole life changes. Yeah. And you, you can't live without Mass. Um, Sunday Mass, but even you know daily Mass. And so it's a key inside of the bishops that uh, the way that revival is going to come uh, is going to be through the Eucharist. It's not going to be through our great social justice programs, you know, however great and necessary those are. It's not going to be because um, we're so articulate and we're addressing all the world's problems, uh, however important all, all that is. Um, this, this revival is really bringing us back to the heart of things. And, to, and we see it time after time, once someone really understands mm -hmm. what the Eucharist is about uh, and who is, is there, who's present, the Lord Jesus, and the implications of that, once someone really enters into that, there's no turning back. And the person catches fire. They eat fire in the Eucharist, and then they catch fire, that fire of, of divine love. And so it's... It's kind of been long in the, in the waiting to, to have the, the church wake up. You know, so I'm thinking especially the fallen away Catholics and those who no longer attend Mass, uh, to wake them up to, to what is there. And so this, this venture of a Eucharistic revival is, is all about trying to accomplish that. So we as a church who are practicing, who do know what we have in the Eucharist, really need to keep this in our prayer and, and participate in, in the efforts as much as we can sharing others uh, about the sharing with others about the Eucharist and in your own uh, encounter with the Lord Jesus you know bearing witness like Dina just did a uh, bearing witness to those you know about the power of the Eucharist in, in your life mm -hmm. that's going to be part of this revival and it's nice that we'll have a, a church as a whole fo focusing our prayers on that focusing our sacrifices focusing our efforts and to see what our Eucharistic Lord does through this okay do you, do you know, Father, what exactly they're going to do with this Eucharistic revival? What exactly? All right. So I think it's still unfolding, and I think it will be kind of an unfolding thing, but you know, certainly an emphasis, you know, encouraging an emphasis on the Eucharist and, and, and preaching, hmm. you know, even at Sunday Mass. Um, but there are going to be other, you know, initiatives here. So there have been a series of Eucharistic, Eucharistic revival preachers who have been appointed, who will have a special role, and let's, you know, preaching retreats. Uh, maybe we'll have, have, you know, old revival tents out or something. <laughs> uh, but just um, people, missionaries of the Eucharist, appointed uh, to, you know, have special gatherings, uh, special conferences, special calling forth people um, to, to gather on the Eucharist. And so it's a new preaching initiatives on that. And by the way, I think we have four or five Dominicans from our province who are on that list of hmm. um, preachers for this Eucharistic re revival. Um, and then we'll have Eucharistic congregus, congresses uh, as well, gatherings to, to think more about the Eucharist and celebrate what we have in the Eucharist. 
Uh, but I think there's much more, but yeah, I don't have uh, the big game plan in my mind. And I think a lot of it is, well, let's, let's discover this as we go. And whatever new initiative you have, people out there, and, uh, and um, Maria Vision, Think, you know, think about it in your own life, think about it in your own parish. Uh, what, what can we do in our own particular circumstances uh, that, that can help this, that can help people realize the gift that we have? You know, whether it's on a personal level, people you know in your life that you can reach, that maybe your parish priest couldn't reach as well because you have that special relationship with them already. Mm-hmm. And you just bear witness to what the Eucharist means to you, the power of the Lord in your life through the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. And giving them good, you know, doctrine, solid truth about what the Eucharist is as well, but bringing that personal uh, witness factor in as well can be huge. Yeah. But then also to think about, okay, your, your um, let's say, groups you're involved with, your Bible study, prayer group. You know, what can you do as a group then? You know, focus your Bible study on the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. Um, have some kind of question and answer thing where you invite seekers, you know, say, we have some, some people here who can articulate themselves well in the faith, and we're going to open it up, invite all our friends, invite your neighbors uh, to come and hear about the Eucharist and, and allow them to ask questions. And so I think a lot of the Eucharist revival, it's not just what they have planned and are doing, but okay, what about <laughs> us? You know, we, have, we also have to be creative and seek the face of the Lord and ask him what he wants each one of us to do and what we as groups to do at, to, together. So it really does have to be an effort of, of the whole church. And so to think about our own personal circumstances as well and what we can do to help us. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Father. We have two more minutes, Father. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it goes fast. Another question I have, I guess, with this Eucharistic Revi- revival. What can you suggest to the listener or the watcher, um, the audience? What should we do in Eucharistic adoration? Some people don't know what they they should do. Right. Know that you know, there's that beautiful story about Saint John Vianney uh, and a person of his, um, you know, peasant. Uh, and asked, John Vianney asked, asked him what he does in front of the Eucharist, and then he says, um, I look at him, and he looks at me. And so, yeah, it's a beautiful occasion in the Eucharist to, to gaze upon the Lord Jesus and to receive his gaze of love into our souls and to know that we're loved, to know that we're in his presence, to get to be like the beloved disciple, the Apostle John at the Last Supper and then rest our, our heads on the heart of Jesus. We can do that in Eucharistic adoration. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes we can envy um, the magi, the wise men, the good, the, the shepherds coming and adoring Christ in the crib. But we get to do the same thing in Eucharistic adoration. Christ is present there just as much and just, a, just as a real way. He's silent like the little baby was. Uh, and we, we get to come and pay him our homage and mm-hmm. to give him our, our worship. And it is one of those things, the longer you're there, the longer you're attracted, the longer you're there, the more the mystery opens up before your eyes and your gaze. So there is a way in which Eucharistic adoration is really a greenhouse mm-hmm. for the life of prayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, things can, can take off. Uh, our faith grows more rapidly, more, more profoundly in the presence of our Lord Jesus in, in the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. In a way, because our faith is caught forth more. You know, it's easy, easy to kind of make an abstract decision in your mind that Jesus is God. Um, it's a little more poignant and sharp and decisive to recognize that what appears as simple bread before you in the Eucharist is actually Jesus Christ through body, blood, soul, and divinity, the Lord himself. That calls forth a great act of faith in a very decisive, practical way. So that helps us to grow in faith, helps us to grow in prayer. There's no consolation like coming before our Lord Amen. and finding rest like he promised. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. By a meek and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I think believers in generation after generation find that to be the case. We come to the Lord in the Eucharist with our burdens. He takes them away, or he strengthens us 
or he consoles us to bear these burdens. He brings us that joy that we need. He brings us that sense of his victory, that his love will overcome all things. We just need to take the time to dispend with him, absorb those rays of love coming forth from the Lord's heart in the Blessed Sacrament of the Eucharist. Thank you. Yes, that's, that's very true. I experienced that as a convert. I, I remember going as a convert, we go to conference to conference, you know, and you get so exhausted. In the church, after Mass, after the adoration, I'm so full. <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> I have this yeah, peace. Yeah. I'm so full. There is just, you don't need to go anywhere. That's, that's all you need. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Amen. that's all we have time now, Father. Maybe you can bless us and close us in prayer. Sure. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of the Eucharist. We thank you that you remain with us, Emmanuel, especially the Eucharist. Lord, we ask that the abundant of blessing upon all these listeners out there, that whatever tabernacle is closest to them, you may radiate a powerful surge of grace and blessing upon each person. Amen, Almighty God. Bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you next week, Father. Thank you. Yeah, God bless, bless you. you.